Welcome to lecture six of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm going to get my screen share started for the presentation. So today we'll be looking at the actual Qumran site. The site was inhabited between 134 BCE and 68. During the year 134, Judea was under Seleucid control. The Hasmoneans and Maccabees had already liberated, liberated the temple in 164. However, Judah the Maccabee was later killed in battle against the Greeks and his brother, Jonathan was ruling uh, about 20, 25 years later, they finally really get rid of the Greeks and they have an independent commonwealth. But at this point, it's still under Seleucid or Syrian Greek control. And in 68, the Romans are putting down the great revolt against Rome in Judea and the site is abandoned. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Before we get there, however, the, uh, we should note that the site is, ice, it is in an isolated area, as many of you know, near the Dead Sea. It's very arid and dry, south of Yerushalayim, of Jerusalem. We're talking about two different places, actually, the archaeological site of where the Qumran sect lived, which is low down on flatland, and then above it there are caves, which the scrolls were found in. Now, where did they uh, get water to live? We should ask that question. They certainly weren't getting it from the Dead Sea. That was not their drinking water. They were getting it from the Wadi Qumran and they diverted water using channels. We should also note that the settlement site of the Qumran sect was 400 feet below sea level, lowest spot in the entire world. And when talking about how the scrolls are preserved, of course, climate plays into that. I believe the site may have temporarily been abandoned due to an earthquake in 31 BCE, but then is repopulated. So let's look at what they actually found at the site. They found 500 coins, most dated to the rule of the Seleucid or Syrian Greeks. As we've already spoke about, the Seleucid or uh, Syrian Greek Empire took control of Judea from the Ptolemaic Empire in about 200 before the Common Area. So this, one, this is one of the days of dating when the sect lived there is by finding remains of what the currency they were using. The coins, interestingly enough, were found together, which indicates a communal treasury. Carbon dating of some of the scrolls dates them to about 100 BCE. So this is still in the Hasmonean era. This is the latter Hasmonean era. At this point, not only is uh, Judah gone, he's not in the scene anymore, but his brother Yonatan or Jonathan is not on the scene. And we're dealing now with an era in which the Hasmoneans are not only ruling as Kohanim, as priests, but also as kings as well. This is right around the time when the transition happens. There was a tower found, a pottery manufacturing area, a kitchen and pantry, a meeting hall, which doubled as a dining hall, a scriptorium in which writing tablets and ink wells were found, an elaborate cistern system and mikvah oat fed by an aqueduct from the wadi. So they had ritual baths as well. Not a surprise, Josephus likes to talk about how pious they were and they were very into purity. So not a surprise at all that you would have uh, a mikvah there. There were no private homes found, which in indicates again that they live basically communally, which fits in with all the evidence we have. And the finding of the writing equipment seems to show that one of the major activities was, was copying these scrolls. Let's look at the caves now in which the scrolls are found. So there are about 100 meters from the Qumran site down below. There were 11 caves uh, which yielded its scrolls. The caves are still about 250 meters below sea level. So again, we take that into account when we talk about how well they're preserved. Most of the caves are natural, but not all. And cave four, a man-made cave, yielded the biggest find of about 500 fragments. There was also a cemetery found. This was excavated, not in the initial round of excavation, which happened uh, shortly after the site was, uh, or, uh, shortly after the scroll was found. But later on in 66 and 67, this, uh, this was a second round, I call it post the Vux. The Vux was the, uh, the archeologist who excavated it in the late 1940s. 
so, but in the second round of excavations in 1966, 67, they also found some female graves. By and large, it's, it's believed, we've said that females weren't living there. This was, this was a celibate sect that was that believed that the end of times was very near, was apocalyptic in nature, which seemed to be a relatively common view during this time. You had different groups. Uh, some of them had apocalyptic type beliefs. Uh, some historians believe the historical Jesus had these apocalyptic type beliefs. That's actually a very uh, common belief uh, when you look at the historical Jesus. So if you believe that the end of the world is coming very soon, God's kingdom is coming, you're not necessarily saying, well, we have to have more children, so we live on for our children. It's basically we need to work on ourselves now to get ourselves ready for God's kingdom. Now, we should note that the Vox, the, Vox, the uh, archaeologists, saw the sect as a forerunner to Christ, Christian priestly order, the Christian priestly orders, based on Pliny the Elder, who described the Essenes as forsaking women and desire. The Vox himself was a Dominican missionary. So, of course, as anyone sees things through their own prism, he's going to look at their behaviors and say, wait a minute, this is how the Christian sects, which even I'm a part of today, we could see this is real where they began to develop from. He may be right, uh, certainly possible. Certainly, it's possible he's right. However, we just should note, of course, that uh, as anyone would, he's going to see things through his own lens. Let's look at some of the other stuff they found. Archaeological remains were found from the Second Temple period. Again, not a surprise that this is taking place during the Second Temple period. During 1993 to 96, so during another round of excavations, there was a stat, there was an absolute established connection between the caves and the community. In other words, these were members of the same community who were living down below in the settlement as well as up in the caves. It wasn't like there were two different groups who happened to be living closely together. Some are some are the lowlanders and some would be the highlanders in the caves. It seems like the community spread out and people started going into the caves as well even living in the caves. Half of the clay pots found in Qumran were imported from Yerushalayim or Jerusalem, which really isn't surprising. It's the, it's the nearest big city. And in small towns, often you have to import things because you don't have the facilities to manufacture all that much. So they're bringing in stuff from Yerushalayim, from Jerusalem. We know there's tension between this sect and particularly the high priesthood in Jerusalem, but it doesn't mean all things Jerusalem are no good. It simply means they're going to have uh, religious uh, points of view, religious slash political differences. There's no real separation with church and state like we have nowadays. So you'll have that. But as far as commerce goes and things like that, we see that they're bringing in pots from Yushalayim. Now, however, the cylinder jars that the scrolls were founded were distinctive to Qumran and the jars found at the caves and the site. So in other words, the scrolls I found were distinctive Qumran jars. They weren't jars that seemed to be imported from Jerusalem and you may find elsewhere in ancient Judea as well because they were being shipped all around the country. So the, scroll, the, the scrolls were found in these very distinctive Qumran type of jars. Now let's look at a legend about these jars. The church father Origen in 200 CE reported a jar of his scroll of the Book of Psalms, Sefer Tehillim, that was found near Eureka or Jericho. Centuries later, the church father Eusebius described the same text and mentioned other Hebrew and Greek texts found in a jar in Eureka in Jericho. So that's 100 years later. So we see that already it's expanding here. There's an expansion of the myth here. First, it's just Sefer Tehillim, the Book of Psalms. And now we're dealing with a Hebrew, uh, other Hebrew works as well as Psalms and now Greek works as well. And this is often the way legends expand. You start off by making a certain claim and then over centuries or over time, it grows in this case is actually uh, from one century to the next. And so now uh, several centuries later, 800 CE, Timotheus the first in the story, and that was one of the early uh, types of Christianity as Christianity was developing. He's an historian patriarch, wrote that the book wrote that a book of the Bible was found near Jericho. So again, we seem to have this legend that keeps popping up. Were these the scrolls and the jars from Qumran? Probably not. But what we do see it was common for groups to hide the scrolls in jars in the desert. Now, what happened to the community? 
the site was abandoned in 68 due to the Roman invasion of Judea. The Romans had uh, attempted to attack Jerusalem first. They were actually repulsed the first time they attacked Jerusalem, and then they went up north. We spoke about Josephus surrendering to Vespasian. And now they're headed back towards the area of Jerusalem, of Jerusalem. And uh, in that siege, they come across, they come across the, uh, the uh, Dead Sea sect. And the sect obviously realizes there are no positions to take on the Romans or take the chances with the Romans. So the site is simply abandoned. It's likely they deposited the scrolls into the nearby caves, hoping that they'd soon be able to return in a few weeks, uh, a few months, a few years, whatever it may be. Now, a copy of one of the scrolls, the Song of the Shabbat Sacrifice, was found 48 kilometers from Masada, leading to the belief that some of the members of the sect may have taken refuge, <coughs> may have taken refuge there. Certainly possible, as it appears that as the Romans were attacking the area, people started to take refuge at Masada. Masada had actually been in Jewish hands since the 50s, and it has served as a, served as basically a fort. And as the Romans are besieging the area, people are taking people are taking refuge there. Interestingly enough, it's actually created as a fort by Herod. He was afraid if there was a coup, he'd need a, a place to uh, protect himself at. So he uh, had Masada built, never actually needed it. But uh, later on, the zealots uh, are able to take it. And of course, this is the last to fall, even three years after the temple is sacked. So, of course, we know the, sac uh, the sect is never able to come back together. They disappear from history. And the disappearance of this sect, as, as well as the Essenes in general, and the Sadducees with the destruction of the temple, really paves the way for the emergence of rabbinic Judaism, which more or less comes out of the Pharisaic tradition. So it doesn't mean that, by the way, any, uh, any type of uh, Essene customs disappear, but however, as a, as a movement over time, they simply disappear and the rabbinic movement becomes the one that wins at, at the end of the day. It's interesting, Josephus originally, when he's talking about the different sects, praises the Essenes. He's not really too big on the Pharisees, but then later on when the Essenes and Sadducees are gone, he starts talking in much more positive terms about the Pharisees. Why? Because he's still living as a practicing Jew in Rome, and the only ball game in town is the Pharisees. The other, the other two movements are no longer there. So he wants to maintain a Jewish community, part of a Jewish community. So if you can't beat him, join him type of thing. And he starts praising the Pharisees, even though originally when the Essenes were active, he was seemed to be uh, most inclined towards the Essenes. So our next lecture will be the emergence of rabbinic Judaism. Thank you for joining me.